Good morning. Welcome back. We're talking about decision trees today. Uh, decision trees are old, um, simple, don't require much statistics or math. <clears throat> Easy to understand, but they are um, still useful. Um, and their main use to us will be not to learn about decision trees, but to use them as a test case for how to assess machine learning algorithms or machine learning frameworks. So I'm going to do that with decision trees. I'm going to do it later with linear regression. I'm going to do it later with neural networks and a few other things. Hopefully, we'll, you'll see that we're using the same process again and again. So then when the next big thing comes around, you, you can do it yourself. Um, what are decision trees? Decision trees are um, methods of making decisions uh, that can be represented by something that looks like a tree. The way to view this is from the top down. What you see in the um, squares are names of attributes in the problem. So the example problem we're working with is the same example problem that we worked with uh, earlier, the uh, enjoy sport problem. Although here, I think Tom Mitchell changed the name to play tennis, but it's the same problem, more or less. So uh, outlook, humidity, and wind are all attributes. They are not all the attributes, but they are some of the attributes. The tree does not have to use all the attributes. And there's a d decision procedure expressed or represented by this tree. And the way to understand it is to start at the very top, look at the outlook attribute, and given a new training example or a new test example, a new input, uh, ask yourself what is the value of outlook? What is the value of that attribute? Since outlook had uh, three possible I'm sorry, so this is a different, um, different attribute than what you had in Enjoy Sport. In Enjoy Sport, I think the Sunny had three possible attributes. Here, Outlook has three possible values, Sunny, Overcast, or Rain. Um, whichever one your current input um, has as a value, you go down that path. So if the Outlook was Sunny and that particular input, uh, you next ask about humidity. And if humidity is normal, you give the answer as yes. If it's high, you give the answer no. You have to have here as many children as there are possible values for that attribute. So if an attribute is binary, it will have two children. If the attribute is trinary, it will have three children, and so forth. Um, if the value of outlook is overcast, you don't ask any more questions. You give the answer yes. This is pretty straightforward. This is a, a very... Uh, concise and um, unambiguous rule for how to classify new instances as long as they all, all of their attributes are known. Um, I get a couple questions at this point. Usually, can you use the same attribute on both sides? Could you put humidity here and humidity here? Does it make sense and are you allowed to do that? Yes, of course you're allowed to do that. It's a free country, you're allowed to do anything you want. Does it make sense? Yes, it does make sense. It could make sense. There's nothing wrong with that. So you may find the humidity attribute here, you may find it here, or alternatively, you may find it here or here or anywhere else. In real trees that are used in the real world, often you have many more branches that go much deeper, although they're also useful when they're short in combination with others. Um, another question I get is, can you see the same attribute, can you use the same attribute um, along the same path? Can you do that? It's a free country, you can do anything you want. But, does it make any sense? No. Why doesn't it make sense? Right. Once you check the value once and you continue down the path in one direction, then the value is already uh, corresponding to the direction you chose. There's no point in asking that question again. You could, but the answer is already known. So in real trees, you will not find the same attribute um, going down on one path which means that there is a limit on the depth of the tree. What is the limit? The number of attributes. You know, it won't be any, any longer than the number of attributes. OK, what can you do with trees? <coughs> 
Um, the example you see here is of a binary tree. Uh, let me put it a little differently. It's not binary. It has three children there. It's a tree that makes binary decisions. So at the leaves, what you have here is the output, potential output from the tree. So this is, tree is used for binary classification or equivalently for concept learning, right? For identifying what, uh, a concept, which is the same as a binary classification. Trees can be used for non-binary classification, classification into more than two categories, trivially, right? You, different categories are here. So you could have red or blue or green or any, any category that you have that, you, that you, you want, any finite task category. So trees are naturally fitted for classification tasks, binary or not. But trees can also be used for the other kinds of machine learning that we discussed, such as regression. How do you use trees for regression? The answer is this <coughs> the exact same way you use it for classification, except in the nodes, you have numbers. We said that regression is learning a function into numbers, into the real line. Um, you just use numbers. Now, th this feels very different than the kind of regression you do with uh, numerical regression, because the output is not from a continuous domain. It's only the values that are in the, in the leaves at the end. But it's still a regression. For the same reason, you can use it for logistic regression. The leaves will have probabilities rather than any old number. You can even use it for density estimation. If you remember what density estimation is, is we're trying to estimate the probability of your input, trying to estimate the probability distribution over inputs. If you go back to your notes and you look at the kind of things we said we typically do with machine learning, it's classification, regression, logistic regression, density estimation. So in density estimation, the input would be some X, some record. You would look at the attributes, and then the output would be how likely or what is the probability of that particular input in the input distribution. You can do that um, as well. For the most part, the trees are used for classification and decisions, and this is why they're called decision trees. But um, keep in mind that they're not just for decisions, and not just for classification. In fact, a common name for trees is CART, which stands for classification and regression trees. Put it. Classification and regression trees. All right, uh, let's see how we can represent different familiar functions in the formalism of a tree. Um, suppose we want to represent the function end between two attributes, A1 and A2. I'm going to assume here that my attributes are binary, uh, but they don't have to be. They could have multiple values, and we'll later talk about how to deal with attributes that have continuous values. How would you represent um, the end function between two attributes in a tree. Well, we start constructing the tree from the top, from the root, but the root here is at the top. Um, which attribute should I put at the root? A1 or A2? It doesn't matter, meaning you could use either. Let's start with A1. A1 being binary, it has two possible values. Uh, by convention, the, I will draw the left child as the one that has the value 0, and the right child is the one with the value 1. Sometimes I may forget or be too lazy or be too much work to draw these, to, to put the 0 and 1, but remember that, um, that the left is 0. Okay, what do I do here? If A1 is 0, what do I do here to implement an end? If A1 is 0, the answer is already known. I'm going to uh, write no here, just to distinguish attributes as being 0, 1 from the output being yes or no, um, just to make it easier to see what's an attribute and what's an answer. But I could also represent it as 0 and 1. Um, so answer would be no. 
Oops. What do I do here? I have to ask about A2. If it says zero, I say no again. If it says one, I say yes. Very simple tree that represents uh, the end function. If I started with A2, I will end up with something very similar. So this tells us our first observation, which is multiple trees can correspond to the same function. So if you ever count, if you're ever in the need of counting, you have to ask yourself first, what are you counting? Are you counting functions or are you counting uh, trees? Uh, in this case, there's only two options, start with A1 or start with A2, but we will see later cases where there's an exponential number of combinations that all of different variations on the tree that all implement the same function. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? I don't know. I guess we live in a, oh, we, we are in a country of choice. People like choice, so. Uh, at some point it could be negative, at some point it could be negative. I guess it depends. Um, what if I want to uh, take the end of three attributes? Pretty easy, isn't it? You just replace this with the question about A3. What if I want 10 attributes? I end up with a very imbalanced tree, right? Nobody says tree has to be balanced. Can you, so 10 attributes would mean that the depth of the tree is 10, order 10. Can you make it shorter? No, I agree with you. I'm not going to give you theoretical proof, but uh, common sense is you can't make it shorter. You need to consult all the... Um, so you're going to have an imbalanced tree that you cannot balance. Oops. All right, what if I want a OR of A1, A2, a3. How do I implement an OR? Easy, right? Start with A1. Zero, one, this time, if I get a one here, I can stop and say yes. If I get a zero, I have to ask about another attribute, say A2. Zero, one, if I get a one, I say yes. If I get a zero, I ask about A3. So it's the mirror image of the end tree with the same problem that it's imbalanced and you cannot balance it. But if you only care about the size of the tree as measured by the number of nodes, the number of nodes you need is linear in the number of attributes. Not bad. Let's try this middle, middle function here. I'll convert it to our notation. Ah, we'll leave it A, B, C, D, and E. Let's assume that A, B, C, D, and E are binary attributes. How do I implement A and B or C and not D and E? What do I start with? Start with A and B. Why? Okay. I would argue you could start with anything. Not clear to me that would make a significant difference. And maybe it does. You'll get different trees, but they will all implement the same function. So there are many, many trees you can build here. Let's start with the A and B. So here we have A, 0 and 1. A and B, meaning that uh, if A is 0, we no longer ask about B, so let's go to 1. If B, 
B is zero here and one here. A and B, if A and B is satisfied, then we have an or, but we don't care about the or anymore. So we can say yes. So this is A and B is yes. But if A and B failed, let's say it failed here, bring it to here. Now we need to ask, now this clause failed, we need to hope that this one succeeded. We have to ask about C or not D or E, or actually all of them. So let me start with C. Zero, one. Um, if zero, we can say no. This failed as well. Um, if one, we can ask about D. And if D is one, we can say no, that failed again. If D is zero, we need to ask about E. And if E is one, we can say yes, otherwise it's a no. Did I do that right? You agree with me? What about this guy? This is another case of um, the, the first clause, A and B failing. So we need to build this clause here. So we need to take this tree as it is and copy it here, right? Move this to here. So we have, should have two copies of this subtree. Nobody's going to ask me about just connecting this to here? Every year, somebody asks, what, what happened? You're not awake enough. Maybe it's the 9 a.m. thing. Now, admit it, didn't it occur to you? Yeah, of course it occurred to you. Right, can you do that? Can you do that? Remember what country we're in? Of course you can do it, but what does it mean? Is it a tree? No, it's not a tree. It's a dag, right? So if your goal is to build a tree, then you can't do that. You can't connect from here to here. Sorry. It's not. But if you're willing to have a dag, that's fine. So tree versus dag. Dag is directed acyclic graph. A tree is a type of dag, but not all dags are trees. Trees are dags that don't have um, cycles. Um, should we use dags? Should we use trees? Does it make a difference? Yeah? In this case, the dag is more efficient space-wise. More efficient representation. Yeah. In this case, a dag is a more efficient representation. Okay. So that might be a, might be a reason to use one versus the other. What difference does it make if we use dags or trees or, I don't know, cars? Mm -hmm. You're saying that uh, if you use DAGs, you don't know the root, or uh, but DAGs being directed, uh, there's a natural order on the nodes. Now there could be some nodes that are not related to each other. That's true. So okay, there could be multiple possible roots. Um, what I'm waiting for you to say is uh, it depends on, on, remember, it's always safer to say it depends, but, you, but then you're in the spot, you need to tell me what it depends on. Um, different representations have different biases, different inductive biases. Maybe different things they can represent or not represent, or different things can be represented easily or not easily. I bet you we can come up with a function that is extremely easy to represent in a DAG, 
but very hard to represent in a tree, or very cumbersome to represent in a tree. This is a small example. We can make it the difference even bigger. Um, so which one has a stronger inductive bias, the eggs or trees? Right. So which has a stronger inductive bias? By stronger inductive bias, I mean puts make stronger assumptions or make or put stronger constraints on you. Every tree is a DAG, but not every DAG is a tree. So the set of all trees is included, is a subset of the set of all DAGs. So if you restrict yourself, say, to trees or DAGs that have no more than 100 nodes, which mechanism would allow you to represent more functions? DAGs of 100 nodes or trees of 100 nodes? Definitely DAGs will represent more, at least as many, mathematically guaranteed, because every tree is a DAG. And chances are they would represent many, many more. So when one formalism can represent more functions, does it have a stronger or a weaker inductive bias? Weaker. A strong inductive bias means stronger constraint, representing less. Which should we have, the stronger inductive bias or the weaker inductive bias? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> On what? I'm not sure. <laughs> how much data we have? Yes. We, when we talked about how strong of assumptions to make, we said that you want to make the strongest assumptions you can, the strongest assumptions that you feel reasonably confident are, are correct, right? But you're also driven by how much data you have. If you have a lot of data, you can afford to not make such as strong of an assumption. So you always have to make assumptions. But if you have a lot of data, you can make weaker assumptions. If you have little data, you have to make stronger assumptions. The worst situation is, of course, when you, have, when you really don't know anything about the domain. You really can't, don't feel comfortable making any significant assumptions. And you have very little data. Then you might as well go home or just try your luck. So whether we want trees or DAGs uh, will depend on uh, how much, how strong of an inductive bias we think we should impose here on whether we think our problem is reasonably represented in trees versus DAGs. Um, but it might depend on one other thing, which is a more pragmatic computational thing, which is it might be easier to uh, work with one or with, the other, or with the other. Actually, it might be easier to work with trees rather than with DAGs. Um, so you may be able to come up with an optimal tree in some sense, but not with an optimal DAG. That's not because uh, DAGs are a bigger set. It's not a question of the size of the set. Some sets are easier to search than others. In fact, there are situations where a larger set is easier to search than a smaller set that is a subset of it. It's a function of the, the set itself, not of its size. OK, so this is about DAGs. Let's try XOR. Function is X, uh, A1, XOR A2. I'm going to start with A1. 0, 1, 1. Ask here about A2, and ask here again about A2. 0, 1, 0, 1. And what do we have here? 0, 0 is a, is a no, a 0. No, yes, yes, no. This is a tree that implements XOR. Very simple. And we see we use the same attribute in both places. What if I want to XOR three attributes? How would you do it? You just 
Add another layer. Add another layer. Okay, you got it. A3, 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 A3. I'm getting lazy here, so I'm just going to do this. Uh, this is 0, 0, 0, so this is no, yes, yes, no, um, yes, no, no, yes. What if I want an XOR of 10 attributes? How would you represent an XOR or a parity function of 10 attributes with a tree? Yeah. It'd be a complete binary tree of 10 levels. Complete binary tree of 10 levels. So you're going to add, you're going to add A4 here, and then A5, all the way to A10. When you get to A10, you have 1,024 nodes at the bottom, right? So the number of nodes in that kind of a tree is going to be exponential in the number of attributes. It's going to be 2 to the number of attributes, maybe plus 1. Uh, can you do XOR with fewer than that many? Can you build a tree that will implement the XOR function uh, with, without having to spell out the entire tree? I see some heads shaking, and I would agree with that. You can't. The, the one way to think about it is uh, the property of XOR that I mentioned to you the last lecture, that it is maximally sensitive to each one of its attributes. No matter the value of all other n minus 1 attributes, the value of the last attribute changes the function completely, always guaranteed to change the value of the function. If you, if you flip it, it'll change the value of the function. So you must consult all 10, which means all paths must be, oh, in this case, 10. In all paths, before they terminate in a leaf, in a leaf, must have uh, must be of depth 10, and there are two to the 10 such paths. So maybe trees are not very good for XOR. That's one conclusion. Slight variation on this: XOR is uh, the parity function. It says parity of A1 through An is um, number of ones. Ones is odd. If it's odd, you say yes. If it's even, you say no. Right? That's what an XOR does. It counts number of ones. Um, you can ask a different question like m of n is exactly m of the n attributes are on. So you're given a, a bit vector of n values. These are the n attributes. And you're asked to count the number of attributes that are on. And to say yes only if exactly m are on. And there are variations. You can say yes when at least m are on, or at, at most m are on, and so forth. Let's say the exactly m are on. How big will the tree be? Mm -hmm. So you're going to have to check at least m levels. If you're counting to m, you have to check at least m levels. But if some of them are not on, you have to keep checking, right? So the tree is also going to be exponential. Somewhat smaller than the extra tree, but also exponential. And the variations with at most, and, uh, at most or at least are going to be also somewhat smaller, but still exponential. So the take-home message decision trees are not good at counting. They're not meant for counting. You can kind of contrast it with standard linear regression. 
where it's very easy to throw in many covariates and to make things proportion, make the output proportional to the value of the covariates. If the value is greater, you know, something like this, um, the m of n would be very easy to do with linear regression. We'll talk about linear regression very soon. So the take-home message is decision trees are, or trees are good for some things, naturally fitted for some things, and not so uh, easily fitted for others. Now, whenever we discuss a new formalism like trees, I will present you with three questions. The questions are, that these are the, the, what I call the fundamental questions of machine learning. The first question is, what is the hard bias? Namely, what is the representation power of the formalism? Namely, what can you represent, what functions can you represent, and what functions you cannot represent? The second question is, what is the soft bias? Namely, what preference within the set of functions that can be represented, how are you going to choose among them if they are equally agreeable with the data? How do you rank them? How do you, um, what we call preference bias or rank bias? The third question is more computer science-y. It's the one of search. Once you've decided on the first and the second, now you have to find the one function that is representable in your space and that is uh, uh, as close to the top of your ranking or preference as, as is agreeable with the data. And now it's a question of can you do it efficiently? Can you find an algorithm that will do it efficiently? The algorithmic part only comes in with the third question. So let me pose exactly these questions here. We'll start with the first question, which is representation power or hard bias. We also call it expressive power. How expressive? Um, except when you say expressive power or representation power, large expressive power sounds like a good thing. It's not necessarily a good thing. Being able to express more means having weaker assumptions. Okay? So more expressive is not necessarily good. So machine learning question, question one. power, also known as representation power, also known as hard bias. What is the hard bias of decision trees. Namely, what is the set of functions that they can represent, in this case binary, binary functions, or alternatively, what functions, what binary functions can they not represent? <coughs> to remind you, when we discussed conjunctions, it was very easy for you to come up with examples of functions, binary functions, that are not representable as conjunctions. For example, a disjunction of two or more attributes cannot be represented as a conjunction. An XOR cannot be represented as a conjunction. Well, we saw that trees can represent ends, and they can represent ORs, and they can represent XORs. So what can they not represent? I'm sorry? The dependence between attributes. So how do you translate it into a function, a binary function, that cannot be represented by a tree? So I'd like you to please form 
Groups of adjacent students, uh, size three is ideal, but if you're four, that's still okay. Two is okay. And reach a conclusion, please. Discuss it and reach a conclusion. Give me an example of a, um, of a binary function that cannot be represented by, uh, by a tree, or if you think there isn't one, give me a proof or show me why there isn't one. But please reach a consensus. Okay, um, did anybody find an example of a function that cannot be represented, a binary function that cannot be represented by a tree? Yes? Just a question of clarification. What do you mean by binary function? Ah, uh, I mean, uh, normally what I mean by binary function is a function whose output is binary. Remember, we talked about that. A real function is a function whose output is real. You know, the, the attribute refers to the output of the function. But in this case, I also assume that the attributes are going to be either binary or at least the finite number of values. So discrete finite attributes. So you have an example? Uh, yeah, and I'm not really thinking about that. So like, uh, like all of 10 points, uh, point was like, the number of tails is like six. The number of tails is six? Yeah. Okay, so you're saying that the 10 um, attributes are the result of the flip of a coin? Yeah. And the function is yes if the number of tails is six. Isn't that um, isn't isn't that an M? Or would I didn't put it here? I erased it. Um, so isn't that a case of uh, counting to six? Exactly M out of N. It is okay. So that won't work. Anything else? Yeah? Um, so it could be something which involves, um, so let's say, you know, output of A1 and A2 and whatever is the value of the function at that point, and that function is taken into, the value is taken into account to calculate the value function on other values. Uh, you're talking about um, a function that has a memory of previous inputs? such that it does some computation on one input and then the result of that computation is considered an input to another function. Okay, but that is kind of outside the scope of our discussion of, I mean, if you want to consider that part of the input, then you'll have to represent it as part of the input. Um, so I wouldn't consider that a, a, a kosher example. Yeah? Uh, function? Which one? A mod modulus function, like mod three. Mod. Okay, that's interesting. So a mod function um, would you would need to represent the numerical inputs as um, as let's say bits. And what makes you think that a mod function was, would not be representable as a tree? Because it has to be cyclic. But the mod is, that's true, but the mod is operating on uh, numbers that must have finite magnitude because we have a finite number of attributes, a fixed number of attributes. So it's a mod over, let's say, m mod n, but m and n cannot be larger than a certain number, right? So you probably could represent it by explicit enumeration. All right, anybody wants to argue that there are no such functions? You wanted to argue that? Yeah, I mean, if you can represent ands and ors, then you can represent mm -hmm. all binary functions because any binary function can be represented as the sum of products or products. If you can represent, uh, specifically, you can represent ands of ors or ors of ands. Every Boolean function, uh, which is another name for a binary function over Boolean variables, Every Boolean function uh, can be represented as an and or, or of ors, or as an ors of ends. Um, okay, somebody else wants to, yeah? I would argue that your worst case tree includes, when you get down to an, there's two b n nodes at the bottom, mm -hmm. and you have a node for every bit in your input space, so then you capture your entire output space. Mm -hmm. so there is no function that you don't capture. So I would agree with both of you. So first we got a mathematical proof, and then we got a constructive proof. 
The mathematical proof said we know that every Boolean function can be represented as ends and ors. As long as you show me that you can represent any ends of or or ors of ends um, in a tree, uh, then um, then you can represent anything. And here we got, let me go in detail over the second uh, proof, which is a constructive proof. Any function, I can draw the tree for you that will represent it uh, without even knowing what the function is until the very last minute. So the tree, in fact, I have one tree that could represent all functions by just changing the values of the uh, labels. So any function from A to N, I would represent, say, A1 here and A2 at this level, just like I did for the XOR function, and A3 here, and so forth. I will continue to build it, sorry, this is 3, until I get to AN, and there are going to be lots of ANs here, right? There's going to be an exponential many of them. Okay. How many leaves are there in this tree? Mm, no, just two to the end. Isn't there, isn't there two to the end? ANs and then outputs are. No, no, ANs. ANs, there's two to the end minus one, maybe. Um, so A1s, there's two to the zero. Oh, right. Okay, so th there's two to the end here, two to the end minus one here. And there are two to the n. Well, I should use the same n. Yeah, this is n. 2 to the n leaves. What do these 2 to the n leaves correspond to? They correspond to an assignment of, va of values to all the attributes. Every possible assignment of values to all the attributes corresponds to one of these leaves, corresponds to a path through the tree and getting to one of these leaves. So, for example, this leaf here went something like this. So A1 was 0, and A2 was 1, and A3 was 1, and A4 was 0, all the way to AN was 1. So there are two to the n paths through the tree, from the bottom to the top. Each path corresponds to a particular, distinct, unique assignment of attribute values. And now all I need to do is to take my whatever function you want, and plop here, yes or no, depending on what value it assigns to that particular combination. If you remember, we said that one way to represent functions is as bit vectors. I'm basically putting down a bit vector here, except I'm using y and n as opposed to 0 and 1. And I can put any bit vector I want here. So I have one tree to end all trees, right? I have one tree that can represent all functions. Of course, some functions can be represented as much smaller trees. So, what is the hard bias of trees? Yeah? I'm sorry? Um, the hypothesis space is the concept space. Okay. Yes. So, in other words, there is no hard bias. You can represent anything. None. Or the hard bias is none, the representation power is complete. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? I'm sorry? Enumerate a bunch of functions. So I would say if, it's, if you force me to say if it's good or bad, I would say it's bad because it doesn't impose any constraint. It doesn't bring in any assumptions. You can't do learning uh, in the space like, like you said. Uh, unless you intend to bring in the constraints through the soft, uh, so, through the soft bias. And so maybe it's not bad, maybe it's a good way to go to do it through the software, but by itself, it's not enough for doing learning. So that means we need to introduce soft bias. 
Now think about the space of trees, space of old trees, and think about what kind of soft bias might you want to introduce. Question? Yeah, I'm glad you remember that. When I was talking about DAGs versus trees, and I wanted to say that DAGs are strictly more powerful than trees because and trees are a subset of DAGs, if you remember. I kind of stopped myself and added a constraint that let's say they have a hundred nodes each. Remember that? I said the set of functions you can present with trees of 100 nodes versus DAGs of 100 nodes. And that is exactly why I did that. Because if you don't restrict the number of nodes, if trees can represent anything, then there are no less than DAGs. Exactly right. All right, now let's impose a soft bias. What bias would you impose on trees? What do you think would be good trees to have. If you could represent, uh, let me stop here and give you time to think. Yeah? Polynomially sized trees? Polynomially sized trees, uh, polynomial and number of attributes. So uh, how do you measure the size of a tree? Number of nodes in the tree. So restrict the number of nodes in the tree to be polynomial and number of uh, inputs. Um, does that impose a bias? Yeah, that's a hard bias, not a soft bias, but um, yeah, that's a fine bias. So instead of saying find a tree that agrees with my training data, which is really easy to find, um, you say find a tree that is polynomial sized that agrees with my training data, and that might be harder to find. So, yeah, go ahead. Um, make, make the tree less redundant. I mean, to meet, to bet, to meet our data, there's a many different kind of size of trees. Maybe uh, if we uh, reach, up, reach the node and we find all the decisions made after that is useless, OK? Mm -hmm. We make made any decisions after a node can reach the same result. OK, then we just stop here, prove the tree. OK. So you're suggesting make the tree less redundant if you discover that from some point on all the decisions are not important, they all get to the same label, then trim that here. I would argue that that would result in a simpler tree, maybe less memory requirement, but it will represent the exact same function. If you did not a priori cut out from consideration, so, you, so if, you, if you do that, the set of trees you end up with still can represent any function. You didn't throw away any functions. So you still didn't change the hard bias. It may be a good thing to do, but you didn't change the hard bias. Any function that could be represented before you did your operation can still be represented after you do your operation. Because your operation does not change what the function is. It just changes the representation, makes it simpler. Yeah? So if you wanted to introduce a soft bias, you could start by enumerating all trees of size one node, and then all trees of size two nodes, mm -hmm. and then three nodes. And your, uh, you, you sort of just decide where you cut off. Right. So your suggestion is effectively to, and the soft bias should be the size of the tree measured by the number of nodes. And you're giving a particular way of going about uh, trying to find the smallest <coughs> tree uh, possible. Yeah, size of tree is a very reasonable bias. Uh, why? So number of nodes, you, you all seem to suggest that we should have small trees, as in small number of nodes. So what does soft bias mean? It means that if you have two trees that both agree with the training data, but one of them is much smaller, have fewer nodes, you would prefer that as the answer. Now the two trees, one big, one small, that both agree with the data, may not agree with future data. So it's important which one you choose, right? You want to choose the one that will likely agree with future data too. And do you feel that a smaller one will do, will do that? Why? It uses less parameters, so easier to generalize. It uses fewer parameters and therefore easier to generalize. You seem to agree? Well, this, you look like you were agreeing. Um, what kind of um, functions do 
smaller trees correspond to? They correspond to simpler functions, right? Uses fewer promise, you mean uses fewer attributes. So you seem to think that a, a function that relies on fewer attributes is better in some sense, it's more likely to be correct in the future than a function that relies on more attributes. Is that true? Yeah? I have a question. Basically, right now you are building your tree based on a function. So actually your function is based, right? Yes. Well, not now. It was until 10 minutes ago. When I started talking about soft bias, function is no longer fixed. So uh, what you mean, like, if you, um, like if you have a certain number of um, tree nodes that you want, what about, like, your, your tree is still growing? What if you, if you already um, reach the limit here? What about the, the parameters coming? I'm not sure I fully understand your question, but let me try to restate the setting I'm in. I do not have a particular function that I'm trying to build a tree for. That I did earlier in the exercise. What I do now is say I have a new formalism for expressing functions. That formalism is complete expressive power. It can represent any function. I know, because I took 10601A or C, that I cannot learn without assumptions. So uh, trying to do learning by just finding a tree that agrees with my training data in some particular case will not work. I need to uh, impose some constraints, and since I didn't impose any constraints on the hard bias, I'm going to impose it on the soft bias. So I'm going to prefer some trees to others. And now my question to you was, what kind of trees are you going to prefer to others? And the answer I got from several of you is prefer small trees. What that means is it's a principle uh, that I would apply to any problem I'm trying to learn. I'm going to take my training data and figure out, let's say, at least conceptually, all the trees that agree with it, of which there are exponentially many. But then among all the trees that agree with my training data, I'm going to pick one as my answer. And you seem to suggest that I should pick the one that has the smallest number of nodes from all the trees that agree with my training data. And that may be a reasonable thing to do, but I'm asking you why. Why, why do you think, presumably your goal is to pick the one that will do well on future data. So why do you think that the smallest tree in that set is more likely to do well on future data than a large tree? A small tree corresponds to a simpler explanation, right? Small tree, you know, the, the size of the explanation is the number of nodes, you know, how many things you have to say. Why do you think that the simpler explanation is the correct one or is the one that's going to do better in the future? Yeah? Can you use the development to do the distribution? You know, um, the last one where we have a development. Right. Um, so it's not adjusting the, the, the hierarchy or the levels of the distribution. You know, you have a threshold. You prefer the smaller ones, but you have a threshold. You may very well be able to do that. I'm asking a much more fundamental question. I'm asking, why do you think a small tree is better? Uh, my point is, if you have a small tree, mm -hmm. it's better if it's, if it's, if it's uh, not that small. And uh, you can still have some prediction on uh, if you have that kind of small trees. Are you suggesting that we use the development set to choose from the set of? Uh, All right, let me, uh, I think I'm not being very clear here. Space of all trees. This is a very big space. It is actually doubly exponential in the number of attributes. Um, right, because it can represent all binary functions, and it's actually even bigger, might be even triply exponential, I'm not sure, exponential. 
This is a big space. Number all possible trees. Small, large, any order of attributes and so forth. Now you have training data. It's labeled. You go through the process that I had you go through in your homework number two of elimination. Conceptually, it's going to be computationally difficult or impossible because the space is very large. But here's your training data. These are the A's, attributes, and here's the Y, the value. You consider each one of the trees, pass it through the data, and you end up with a somewhat smaller space of only the trees that agreed with the training data. This is your version space, right? It could still be extremely large, but it's smaller than this because many, many trees don't agree with this data. Now, how do you choose a member of this? You suggested pick the one that has the smallest number of nodes. If multiple trees have the smallest number of nodes, just pick one randomly among them. But prefer trees that have smaller nodes. And my question to you is, why? Yeah. Uh, like, if you pick a larger tree, it's already made some of the decisions, so maybe it doesn't allow for as much uncertainty in the future data. While making the decision, maybe the smaller one. Do you want uncertainty in the future? Or do you want to just be as accurate as possible in new data? Here's the unseen data. Unseen future data. Who do you pick from here? Who, whom to pick? from here to do well on the unseen data. Yeah? So we always have to assume that there is some kind of structure in the problem that we're trying to solve for nothing that's any test. If we have a large tree, the tree can effectively just encode the training data to some degree, depending on how large it is. Uh, whereas a small tree has to find some kind of structure that holds on at least the examples that it's seen. And if we assume that the training data are representative of the general data, then it stands to reason that the patterns that we've found on the training data might also hold on the test data. Let me paraphrase that. Let me first say I agree with it. Um, we are hoping to learn because we're hoping that there's some kind of regularity uh, in, in the data. And a, if you found a simple explanation that explains all this data, um, you probably latched on to that regularity or something close to it. Whereas if in order to explain this data, you had to give an explanation that's as complicated as this data, a very, very big complex explanation, then maybe you didn't latch on to this regularity. Maybe you're just memorizing the training data in some way. Okay? Um, you could argue with that. There are many arguments um, about that. This is uh, a, 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 an, a long old philosophical debate about are simpler explanations preferred, uh, but generally we accept that simpler explanations are better probably for that reason, because they're less likely to have fit by accident. Let me give you another, um, another hand-waving argument for that. If you ordered all the explanations in the world into by degree of uh, simplicity, At the top would be the simplest explanations. There are far fewer simple explanations than there are complicated explanations. So this would look like a pyramid. Very simple. And then simple. And then kind of simple. And then really complicated. If you have to write down explanations, a complicated explanation takes more space to write down, and you can write more different things in it, right? A simple explanation, you can only use a few words. There's only so many things you can say. So really complicated. So just from a numerical consideration, if you restrict yourself to a simple explanation, you restrict yourself to a very small set, 
And the fact that you f managed to find a member of that set that explained all the data is significant. It's, it's, it's not trivial. If it explains all the data, it probably is onto something, hand waving. Whereas if you have a huge space of possible explanations, it's easier to find something that would fit the data for no good reason. Namely, latch onto the data, namely overfit. It is easier to see that in a numerical example. So let me give you this numerical example. Here you have x and y. It's a function from x to y. And your training examples look like this. One is here, one is here, one is here, one is here, one is here. I think that's enough. One, two, three, four, five training examples. And um, I'm telling you that these examples were generated from a polynomial. Some polynomial with some error. So y is a polynomial of x plus some error, small error. And I want you to learn the polynomial. Which polynomial will you learn? Well, you can try to fit a um, second degree polynomial. That's a parabola. And we know how to fit a parabola so that it minimizes some of squared errors to the points. And it would look something like this, maybe. Maybe, maybe more like this. Here are the errors. But you don't have to use a parabola. Polynomial can be third degree polynomial. Would the third degree polynomial fit better or worse than a parabola? And what makes you so sure? It contains all it has more degrees, but that's not enough. It contains all parabolas as a special case. So it's a strictly larger set. If I fit a third degree polynomial, the best fitting one might look like this. Here, they are very similar. So this is a degree two, this is degree three. Here, they look similar. Maybe it's not a big difference. But here, there's a huge difference between them. So whichever one I choose can have significant consequences for future data points. If the future data points fall here, there's a big difference. I still didn't fit it perfectly. But there's a fundamental um, theorem in algebra, I think, that says that if you have n data points, you can perfectly fit an n minus 1 degree polynomial to them, n data points in general position. So here we have five data points. I could fit a fourth degree polynomial with no error at all. It would look like, what would it look like? I'm guessing it would look like this. No error, d equal five. And don't forget d equals one. You could decide that you want to fit a straight line to it. Doesn't look great, but you can do the best you can with a straight line. It might look something like this. And you can even fit a degree zero polynomial, which is a constant, which is a flat line. Which of these should you choose? Which function should you provide as the output of your learning? Given just these data points, there's four, five, four, four, five. Five data points. Okay, it's really hard to say. It is hard, but if you have to, what would be your preference? Would you choose d equals one? Why not? It doesn't seem to agree with the data. You don't expect it to produce data. I mean, you expect it to produce data that's more or less along the line, right? So, I mean, if you're judging by agreement with the data, you should take d equals 4, right? It has zero error. The agreement with the data is perfect. 
You're saying that you should take two or three because they're more generalizable to future data points. I agree with you that the criteria should be which one will generalize best to new data points, which will do best on, say, a point here or a point here or a point here. Uh, but you didn't quite tell me why you think D2 or D3 will do better. I'm sorry? Take an average? What do you mean by that? Oh, you're suggesting that we average the second and third degree in some way? But I'm asking why even second, why do you choose D2 and D equals 3? What makes you think that a second degree or third degree polynomial is a better answer than a I say fourth degree. What's wrong with the fourth degree polynomial? It's overfitting. Or what makes you think it's overfitting? Because you only have five right. You only have five data points, so you should make some additional assumptions. You should not allow yourself complete freedom. Is that what you're saying? Ah, that's an interesting point. It seems a little suspicious that you would have no errors at all on these five data points. So maybe you want some error. Um, but what I was hoping you would look at is this. What is there more, polynomials of second degree or polynomials of fourth degree? The answer is they're both infinite. So we need to change that question. Which has more expressive power? Polynomial of fourth degree have much more expressive power. It's easy to see if you compare it to polynomial of first degree, straight line. There are things that a parabola can do that a straight line cannot do. In fact, many, many things. And there are things that a third degree polynomial can do that a second degree polynomial cannot do. So there's a hierarchy of polynomial expressiveness. And if you go down the pyramid to the place where you can express anything, you can match any five data points, the chances are that you will not find regularities. You will basically be learning, overfitting. You all said the right thing. I was just looking for a different way of thinking about it. By giving yourself too much freedom, you will fit the training data beautifully, maybe more than is reasonable, uh, more than you would expect, but there's no reason to think that you latched onto something regular, into the rule that underlined the data. By the way, I might choose d equals 1. Why am I, might I choose d equals 1 straight line? If you have some additional knowledge about the background of where the data came from, thank you. If I have some additional background knowledge about where the data came from. If I have some reason to think that the dependence is linear, now how does that agree with the data, with the fact that it's all over the place? Huh? Can you also look at the arrow on the graph? So if, there, if the arrow, like the expectation of the arrow is pretty big, and also if there's like a pattern in the arrow, then that probably is not linear. If there's a pattern in the error, then probably it's what? It's not linear. It's not linear. Then, then my assumptions are probably wrong. That is true. Well, let me give you the scale here. Uh, this is a um, measure of temperature. Temperature. And uh, shall we measure it in Celsius? Most of you are familiar with Celsius. Yeah. Uh, this would be someone's temperature and it would be um, 37.0 is here, uh, 37.01 is here, and 37.005 here, and 006. And in other words, 
I fooled you by stretching the y-axis. <laughs> these are really tiny measurements with lots of you know, thermometer error, and this is like measured in, say, minutes. So you take someone's temperature, and maybe it gradually moves up a little bit. So what is a large error? We don't know. It depends on, on what you're measuring and the, on, the, on the device and on the circumstances. So it's not clear just by looking at the data that there is something there. It could be, I might even model it with a d equals zero. No, it doesn't change much from minute to minute. It's all noise. All right? So you've got to bring outside knowledge. Um, I'll leave you with one thought. Um, We're trying to maximize agreement with the training data. In the case of the polynomial, the higher the degree, the better it agrees with the training data until you get to the extreme point of d equals 4, and then it agrees with it so well that there's absolutely no error, which is a little suspicious. But, uh, but in general, better agreement with the training data is better. At the same time, we're also trying to make it as simple of an explanation as possible. In the case of polynomials, that means a lower degree. We want the best agreement, and we want the best simplicity. If we add them, and we take the argmin over all functions, I know this is very mathematical, um, this is the essence of machine learning. This is the second thing I want you to learn. Until, uh, the first thing is that no learning without assumptions. The second thing is that almost all learning involves minimizing, or actually it's maximizing, if you talk about agreement. <laughs> maximizing the sum of agreement with the training data and simplicity. When we talk about simplicity, uh, you, some of you may be familiar with the concept of Occam's razor. Occam's razor is an old philosophical principle that says that when two explanations uh, both explain something equally well, you should prefer the one that's simpler. Okay? That's a special case. What if they don't fit exactly equally well? In the case of the polynomials, they don't fit exactly equally well. Some of them fit better than others, but also some of them are more simple than others. You're trying to balance simplicity with the fit of the data. Now, how do you Measure this, still wide open. How do you measure this, still wide open? And how do you combine apples and oranges? How do you add together two things that are so different? One is about agreement with the data, the other one is about simplicity. That's also an open question. We'll deal with all of these, but the big picture is this is what you're trying to do. Thank you, we'll see you on whatever Monday.